Hello, my name is Alexander Lawson, and I'm the Museum Learning Manager at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. This video will explore the wartime industrial contributions of African Americans and women in Maryland during World War II, while also exploring the discriminatory practices that affected black men and women taking part in the war effort. One of the major wartime industries in Maryland was shipbuilding. Baltimore was known for shipbuilding long before the Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard began building Liberty ships during World War II. The Revolutionary War provided an opportunity for Maryland-based shipbuilders who were not restricted by British blockade or occupation like those in Philadelphia and New York to begin to grow and hone their craft. By the time the United States had firmly established its independence at war's end, Baltimore had emerged as one of the leading centers for shipbuilding in the United States. Much of the shipbuilding in Baltimore took place along Fells Point, named after William Fell. Shipbuilders such as David Stoddard, the builder of the USS Constellation, and Thomas Kemp, the builder of the Chasseur, began to set up workshops that churned out hundreds of vessels with the most famous type being the Baltimore Clipper. Although shipbuilding would begin to slow in Baltimore during the Civil War, the industry continued to operate around the Inner Harbor. During World War I, due to its strategic location, the federal government began offering federal money to shipbuilding companies in Baltimore. Private companies such as Baltimore Dry Dock and Shipbuilding, Maryland Shipbuilding Company, and Bethlehem Steel expanded their shipbuilding operations. While the federal money coming into Baltimore was not to the extent of World War II, it laid the foundation for the industrial growth that would occur between 1940 and 1945. In March of 1941, Nine months before the United States entered World War II, the United States passed H.R. 1776, a bill to further promote the defense of the United States and for other purposes, also known as Lend-Lease. This bill allowed President Roosevelt to lend or lease any military material he deemed vital to the defense of the United States to any other nation, primarily Great Britain, to assist in their fight against Nazi Germany's assaults. The United States began to prepare for war while staying neutral. Shipping these items through the North Atlantic was incredibly dangerous due to the risk of attack by German U-boats or submarines. The attacks on British merchant ships in the North Atlantic devastated the country's merchant fleet and led to a lack of vessels to transport the Lend-Lease material. As a result, the United States took over shipping of the Lend-Lease military supplies. Like Great Britain, though, the United States did not have enough vessels to transport the materials. But unlike Great Britain, the United States had massive shipyards and enough manpower to staff the shipyards 24 hours a day. To transport the Lend-Lease materials, the United States Maritime Commission designed a cheap-to-build class of merchant ships known as Liberty Ships. Liberty Ships were built at 18 different shipyards throughout the United States, with Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard in Baltimore being one of the largest. In August of 1941, Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard had a contract for 62 ships in September of 1941, the shipyard launched their first and the nation's first Liberty ship, the SS Patrick Henry. Between 1941 and 1945, the Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard built around 384 Liberty ships and brought the production time of one ship down from 244 days to only 30 days. These ships were designed to be built quickly and utilize new manufacturing techniques. Liberty ships used prefabrication, but one of the major reasons the Liberty ships were built so quickly was due to the sheer number of people involved in building the ship. In April of 1941, the Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard employed around 350 individuals, but this number grew exponentially as war production increased. But despite this growth and the readiness of black Marylanders to work in the defense industry, the Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard would not hire black workers until a government order requiring equal practice was passed. The shipyard dropped their color barrier on December 6, 1941. Despite the ability to work in an integrated environment, the shipyard did have discriminatory hiring practices and routinely hired white applicants over black applicants. By the start of 1942, 11,000 men and women worked at the shipyard. In late 1943, the number was at its highest with around 47,000 employees, 6,000 of whom were African American. The Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard was not the only war industry that discriminated against black Marylanders. In fact, despite discriminatory hiring practices, the dry docks where the ships were built were integrated. This could not be said for other war industries in Baltimore. At the start of World War II, the Allied forces required thousands of airplanes to help defeat Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. 
With factories in Europe destroyed, airplane manufacturing became a major wartime industry in the United States. In Middle River, Maryland, the Glenn L. Martin Company, which had been based in Maryland since 1924, began to increase its production of military bombers. Initially, before the United States entered World War II, the Martin factory hired only white men to work on the production lines. Managers of the factory believed that hiring black workers would lead white skilled workers to leave. They also believed that a thousand man hours of defense work could be lost by the distraction caused by just one woman on the factory floor. As the United States geared up for war in 1940 and early 1941, the Martin factory dropped its gender barriers, but not its color barrier. The Martin factory began to increase their hiring of women to work in the factory and by the end of the war, around 16,000 women worked in the plant. These women, known as Rosie the Riveters due to the rivet guns they used, built the famous B-26 Marauder bombers night and day in the Martin factories. Not all of the 16,000 women were white. Many of the women were women of color, but they would not get their chance to support the war effort as early as the white women did. By mid-1941, the Martin plant was still restricting black Marylanders from working at the aircraft plant. It wouldn't be until the United States government and President Roosevelt stepped in and required the Martin factory to hire African-American workers that the color barrier finally broke. By October of 1941, of 8,769 jobs at the plant, only 13 were filled by non-white workers. Despite being forced to break the color barrier, the Martin factory segregated their factories and did not allow many black workers to work at the plant in Middle River with the white workers. Most of the black Martin employees worked at the segregated fabrication plant on Oldham Street in the Canton area of Baltimore. Although the number of total workers and number of women at the Glen L. Martin factory is known to be around 54,000 and 16,000 respectively, the number of black women and men who work at the Martin factory is unknown. Yet despite facing the discrimination and segregation, these men and women played a vital role in the war effort. The war industries were not isolated only to major cities. Almost every industrial town took part somehow. In Maryland, while Baltimore received much of the credit for the home front work, due to the Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyards and the Glen L. Martin factory, Hagerstown, Maryland and its citizens were busy working just as hard at the Fairchild Aircraft Plant. The Fairchild Aircraft Plant primarily built trainer aircraft. While the Fairchild Plant initially didn't hire women, by November of 1941, 35 women worked at the plant. By early 1942, they aimed to have 200 women on their payroll. By October of 1942, the Fairchild Plant wanted to hire 1,500 women to work in the factory. But there were restrictions on who could do what jobs in the factory. Women who were 5 foot 3 inches or taller, weighed around 125 pounds, and were 20 to 33 years old would work as riveters and drillers, while those who did not fit within these restrictions would work in sedentary jobs such as sewing textiles and making upholstery for seats. Similar to the Martin plant in Baltimore, black employees at the Fairchild plant faced discrimination and segregation while trying to help the war effort. The Fairchild plant did not hire its first black employees until August of 1942 when 50 workers graduated from the North Street Training School. Despite being hired by the factory, these workers were forced to work in the segregated plant number no. 7, which contained an all-black workforce, including the factory foreman. The hiring of black workers at Fairchild, Martin, Bethlehem Fairfield, and other factories ended discriminatory practices at wartime employers in Maryland but many black workers still face segregation in the factories and all face segregation and discrimination outside of the factories. One of the largest areas of discrimination centered on housing. Unlike previous and more gradual population increases that allowed Baltimore to better accommodate, the population boom that came with thousands moving to the city in search of wartime employment following the Great Depression created a major housing and resource shortage in the city. This shortage was especially hard for black workers. While the Glen L. Martin factory brought in trailer homes, built dormitories, and built around 2,000 temporary houses, this housing was only for white defense workers. In 1941 Baltimore Sun article, the only available housing for black defense workers were at the Poe Home Projects, but that only housed 300 people. According to the article, the McCullough homes were to be completed soon. Nevertheless, housing for black Marylanders and defense workers was overcrowded to the point where it was almost impossible to secure living quarters of even the most primitive type. With the overcrowding of wartime housing, Maryland and the federal government began to look for locations to build black wartime housing. 
One of the first suggestions was to build this housing near the Herring Run in Northeast Baltimore. This plan fell through as protests by white Baltimoreans living in the area caused the project to be abandoned. In response, developers began to look towards other areas to build defense worker housing. One area was the Cherry Hill neighborhood of Baltimore, but just like Herring Run, White neighbors put up a fight against the development of this neighborhood. Despite the protests, the federal government went ahead with building between 600 and 700 permanent houses for black defense workers. When the call went out for workers to man the machines and help win World War II, black Marylanders and white women stood up to answer the call. Nevertheless, factories only wanted to hire the white women at the beginning. To the factories, the color of one's skin was more important than the ability to work machines and produce war material. It was only when President Franklin Roosevelt stepped in, combined with a campaign led by black newspapers to shame companies that did not hire black workers by calling them Nazi sympathizers, that factories began to hire black workers. Nevertheless, many of the factories segregated black workers. Despite facing segregation at the factory and within Baltimore, these workers showed up and helped win the war. For women, Factories provided the ability for many to enter the workforce for the first time. With men fighting in the war, women, black and white, flocked to the factories and built planes, ships, tanks, and every other war material. Not only did they build material, women planted victory gardens, rationed their food, and kept the United States moving. These Rosies played as much of a role in winning World War II as the soldiers. Nevertheless, following the end of World War II and the return of men from war, factories began to fire these women believing that women now needed to return to the home so men could work and provide for their families. The contributions of black and female Americans led to the Allies winning World War II.